open your eyes, look around. We live in a three-dimensional world. We are designed to perceive that in our environment. Recently, a lot of work has been done in generating 3D point clouds. You can visit the famous Rath House of Hamburg or observe the iconic skyline of New York, all thanks to Google Earth. We have been able to perceive depth in a computer screen as well. However, creating the 3D world in a computer is still an expensive and time-consuming task. There has to be a better, more economical way to model the real world in all its dimensions in a computer. We have set out to create a new, cheap, accurate way to obtain 3D point clouds. This is how we did it. Prototype, GTA 4, Spider-Man are some of the gaming titles which are well known for its accurate representation of different cities in it. In this case, New York. This is accomplished using countless hours of hard work for number of people. Surprisingly, this is the cheaper option. Another option for game makers to create 3D worlds and for other users to create 3D worlds is using cars with special sensors on it to drive around and capture data. This is similar to the Google Street View cars, but with that data as well. However, the equipment used is very expensive, and the companies which offer the service charge even more. The task of this project is to come up with an economical method to acquire 3D data from a mobile platform. Given the problem we have to solve, our approach on paper is quite straightforward. We have laser scanner, which we use for 2D scan matching. We have odometry data, which we get from IMU and Orden board diagnostic device from the car. And we have the GPS sensor. We take the X, Y, and theta coordinates uh, from each of these three sources, along with their covariances. Uh, covariance represents the degree of accuracy for each of the three sources. These, this data is then entered into the extended Kalman filter, or the EKF filter, which then combines these input values according to the covariances to give us the optimal global pose. Uh, since our laser scanner were indoor scanners, they failed sometimes outdoors, so we needed something to restart it. This is done by taking the global pose and using it to restart the 2D scan matching. This global pose is also then used to get the 3D map we need by relating each scan line we get from 3D laser scanner to the global pose at that time. Hello. Before we start coding and uh, getting the data to work on, we first have to set up the hardware. We had two LMS laser scanners. Um, we had a Regal 3D laser scanner. We had an IMU device, a GPS receiver, and an onboard diagnostic device. We first had to power them all. Um, this was done by connecting the battery in serial and parallel um, according to what was needed to the device. Um, then we configured the device. Uh, for instance, in case of uh, LMS laser scanners, we had to assign different static IPs to both devices so that they can be used at the same time and we can distinguish the data coming from those two devices. Um, once this was done, uh, we set up everything, uh, mounted all the devices on the rack we had for the car. Um, an example of the final layout is shown here. Um, the LMS um, laser scanners, two of them, um, the Regal 3D laser scanner um, were connected to a hub via Ethernet ports and um, this 
was then connected to the laptop via Ethernet cable as well. Um, the IMU device and the GPS were connected to the laptop via serial port and um, the onboard, that onboard diagnostic device was connected to the car via USB port. Um, once everything was set up, uh, before we could actually start recording data, we had to write drivers for all of them. Uh, this was done using ROS framework. Um, we then carried out a number of runs to record the data so that we could work on it offline. Uh, the data was stored in back files. Uh, one problem we faced while actually recording the data was that uh, was the lack of um, unified startup script. So one of us had to be there in the car um, manually entering the commands in the different terminals to enable all the right data was the acquisition. Um, once that was done, we had a large number of data sets on which we could do our test runs. Thank you. Okay, a very crucial step in this overall project was to understand how the Regal framework operates and to be able to control this uh, scanner sufficiently well. And another thing is to actually and have a deeper understanding into the back to scan framework which actually takes this point cloud by or points from the regal and using other sensor information and computes the overall trajectory and point cloud. Now about the regal integration into ROS, um, the regal scanner is not feeding its information, namely the point cloud information or the single points into regal compatible back files. Uh, rather, it writes all its, all its information into one big binary file, out of which you have to convert it back into a point cloud that you can operate on. Um, all this is handled already by existing um, ROS implementations that we can, uh, were able to build upon, um, but it's a rather complicated framework which has to be understood thoroughly before working on it. One aspect of this is that um, the scan, the full 360 degree scan of the Regal scanner uh, takes more than no time, uh, meaning that the car will have moved in between um, the operation of the Regal scanner and that would lead to a totally blurred image if you would uh, convert it into, into a one point cloud. Rather you have to um, deal with this scan line by scan line, which is a vertical scan line in this, in this, um, in this aspect. And doing this needs to be, uh, to be relying on the timestamps associated with, with each of the um, scan points and of course known by the ROS implementation. So what the code in the background does, and it does it for you, you don't have to take much care of this, you only have to know that it is like that. Um, it reads one scan line, um, which is associated with one timestamp coming from the ROS framework. As I mentioned before, we are using two LMS laser scanners on our project. One is mounted in front of the car, scanning horizontally. One is mounted on top of the car, scanning vertically. Um, in 2D scan matching, we are using the one which is facing forward, scanning horizontally. Um, I'll tell you how scan matching basically works. It's a really simple idea. Uh, take this image for example uh, with our car. Um, it has a laser scan scanner mounted on it. It scans um, the horizon and discovers the building present. The scan is marked in black. Then the car moves a certain distance, now we scan again, and now the scan is marked in red. Uh, since we do not have access to a uh, number of revolution made by each of the four wheels of the vehicle, we cannot find out how much the car has moved. So we use scan matching by transforming the second scan to match the first scan. This transformation will then give us um, 
the movement of the car between those two scans and that's basically what scan matching is. Hi there, this is Vladislav and I was working with Spicel on the scan matching part of our project. The first question that we had to answer was whether to use the already existing ROS node or create one of our own. We looked around and we found there were, that there were already two existing scan matching nodes in ROS. Uh, that was the Polar Scan Matcher and the Canonical Scan Matcher. We tried both of them, however, none of them gave us the result that we wanted. Plus, one of them didn't perform in real time, which we thought at that point of time that it was necessary. Uh, so we decided to go ahead and create the ROS node of our own. For that, we used the ICC scan matching algorithm that we talked a lot about in class. Uh, to, we, we used several methods from the already existing software that was developed in Professor Nukter's lab, uh, SLAM 6D. To be more precise, we used the ICP 6D APX um, version of ICP, which uses the uh, sine x equals x approximation and has, has the name 660 APX. Um, so we created the node and it was publishing the uh, information about the current pose estimate over and over and over again. However, uh, at some point of time, while the project was developing and evolving, we realized that what we actually wanted was to have uh, this information pulled from some other classes and uh, parts of the project rather than having it constantly being published. So we changed our code a little bit and we ended up with the class called Plan 6 which had the um, get pose method, which, to, which was taking the current pose and the uh, scan and uh, performing the scan matching from the scan that we just got and the previous one that we already had, and therefore making the new approximation of the pose and hence returning this pose. Uh, so that, that's basically what uh, our main part of the project was. We ended up with the method that was giving the current uh, the current pose based on the previous pose and the um, and the estimation and the scan. Okay, so as we said, the car is uh, equipped with several sensors. For example, the wriggle, which is the biggest sensor, and records like uh, points and the distance to them. The other sensor is the GPS, and we have two six sensors, and the last but not least is the IMU sensor. So all of these sensors give us some data. What is important is to put them in a common frame. For that reason, the first thing we need to do is to compute the static calibration between each of the local frames of the sensors. But how the static com transformation is computed or calibration is by measuring by hand the, uh, the distances between each of the sensors and computing with based on these measurements, the transformation between each, between each of the local frames of the sensors. And this gives us the static calibration that is later used in the IKEA filter. So, all the static calibration information is stored in a file, calibration.yml, and this is loaded, and this information is made available to ROS through this command, ROS par and load, and the calibration file. So next in our work is to prepare feeding all the sensor informations into the EKF, into the um, Kalman filter, um, which basically means we have to um, define channels for all the sensor information. Uh, and this is work which um, has to be done very carefully. Um, the sensors have different degrees of freedom and for all these sensors so we use, you need differently configured channels in the Kalman filter to account for this information and to, um, to, to calculate um, the overall estimates based on all sensor information. What this means is the IMU information is fused together as we will see later with information coming from the car those together form a channel giving x, y, and some angle theta. And we call that the odometry channel for brevity odom. We don't talk about the six sensors in our uh, contribution so far. This will also be dealt with later. We also don't talk about the GPS, but of course we also have the Beagle Scanner, which is completely treated outside 
the Kalman filter. So once we have the uh, static calibration measured, um, we can feed that, as you have seen, into the uh, EKF already. And, uh, and the static calibration, so only the measurement that we took by hand with the ruler on the setup of, on our car, um, gives us quite reasonable results uh, when we calculate the final trajectory and when we uh, uh, calculate uh, the point cloud from that. But we expect that this can be uh, very much further improved still by setting up the dynamic calibration based on these um, information items from the static calibration. But dynamic calibration is handled um, differently. Hello, uh, I'm working on calibration part and the calibration right now we have gone manually, manually means we have measured the value and we have set up matrix parameters and what I'm doing, I'm trying to implement the calibration automatically, meaning it fits the value automatically and create an update in the new file, uh, calibration new YAML and that means the exchange in YAML file. And my task now, is, and the problem I'm facing now is it's not, I have to do the calibration for all the changes, and my second thing is for everything. So that's currently I'm doing, and hopefully it will be finished and we'll have a new file and put the calibrated parameters will be. And if that works, then we'll have a good result, and we hope for the good result. Yeah, yeah. Before, uh, before that, uh, I was working in IAM and the problem was to um, write the one five for the IAM and the repository we, uh, repository we, we already had. So we, what we did is we uh, combined the launch file with all the features and they connected the IAM in properly uh, and then we drive the IAB part. So it was uh, more on the uh, last part, making the one file properly and making uh, our uh, code uh, work properly. So that was done initially and it was working fine with uh, collaboration with all other changes and uh, the data from the slab uh, to six uh, language numbers and the other code and combined with the IAB and it was perfect and it is working. Yes. Hi, my name is Vitri. Uh, in our project, I was responsible for developing a ROS node uh, which reads and publishing uh, information from car, like car velocity, for example. So for this proposal, we used this device. It called ODB, which means onboard diagnostic. So it could be just simply plug it into the special uh, interface connector inside the car and it gives us an access uh, to a car subsystem. So in our uh, CAN filter and CAN machine we require only the car velocity. But with this device we also can read uh, such parameters like car RPM or uh, I don't know, temperature of different sub systems in the car. Okay, for this purpose, I developed a Linux driver which initialized and uh, opened a USB port uh, connection to the ODB, uh, ODB bus and, uh, and retrieved the car velocity speed by sending a special get commands which, holds, which, can, uh, which contains a list of parameter values. So, that's it. Okay, uh, and also we faced this problem that uh, the ODB returns current car velocity from the speedometer and according to the uh, international agreement speedometer returns a uh, value that exceeds the current speed of the car by some value like 110% so for using this uh, parameter in our ECF filter we need to calibrate it somehow and this become a huge problem because um, this speedometer error uh, depends on many parameters like the current car velocity itself and for example even for the region where uh, the car was produced.
So, if this is the starting position of the car at time t0, and imagine now we're at the position here, and this is time t1. And what we do, we compute the distance between these two by timestamps, and that is based on the average speed and the delta t. So we have delta t times v average, and that is equal to d. And this is the distance traveled in between these two timestamps. And what we need to compute is actually delta y and delta x. And that is computed using this angle theta that is given by the IMU orientation. And once we compute delta x and delta y, we just add them correspondingly to the starting position or to the current position before that. So, the odometry estimate is based and or dependent on two sensors. The first one being the car diagnostic readout interface, which gives us the speed in kilometers per hour and read this information every second. And the second one is the inertia measurement unit, which gives us the orientation of the car. And it is in the form of a quaternion that we use later to convert it to uh, the theta angle that is being used in the further Computation. Um, so yeah, the, the, the information to derive these, uh, these, these um, positions in the end, and also of course the theta angle, um, come from two sensors that we have available. Um, one is commonly referred to as the ODB, which is the car diagnostic readout interface. Uh, you can connect to this um, with a simple uh, hardware piece, which plugs into your computer by a USB port. But basically the only information that you can read out since you are not the vendor of the car, um, will be the, the car speed not normally in kilometers per hour and you have to convert it and you can even only read it out once per second and not arbitrarily often. So it's a rather coarse measurement. The inertia measurement interface uh, unit is the second uh, sensor that we employ. This gives you acceleration in each spatial direction and uh, derived from that um, also um, rotations around all three angles and we are only interested in one the angle in uh, around the C axis of course you don't get absolute angles but only increments to, to the angle so you have to add up your theta over time and this is our theta in this drawing over here Another important sensor at our disposal was the GPS receiver. This relies on signals from satellites orbiting the Earth and refreshes periodically. This way it does not accumulate error unlike other sensors we have. Uh, the first challenge we faced was connecting the GPS receiver to our computer. This was finally done using serial port connection. Um, another problem was converting the global um, value we get of our le longitude and latitude from the GPS receiver into uh, global into the global coordinate frame of our car. Um, once this was done, we could find the distance moved by the vehicle with respect to its initial position. Another challenge we faced was figuring out how to fill in the covariance matrix. Um, the accuracy of receiver relies on many factors such as the number of satellites it's detecting and the signal to noise ratio. Um, once we had an acceptable matrix we had very decent results and it contributed towards our final um, analysis of the global pose of the car. Once all these different channel data is brought to the extended common filter, what is very important is to find an appropriate way how to treat this data and use it for computing the overall trajectory that we give it as an output at the end. Which is very important to be correct because the positions and the orientations are very important for computing the general output at the end which is the point cloud which pretty much depends on the correct orientation and position estimates.
Now that we have a good estimate for global posts from our EKF filter for different timestamps, this can then be used to create 3D point clouds. The software we used for visualization was show from SLAM60 project. Here you can see the results we achieved during the project. The results seem very accurate from an overview, but mismatching can be observed when we look closely at some of the overlaps. This is mostly because we accumulate errors in some of the sensor values, and this is not being properly corrected by the EKF filter. However, for the low cost and simple setup we have developed, these are very good results. Future work on this project will enable us to make these results even more accurate. Uh, personally, to me, the hardest part of the project, or the most challenging part of the project, was to get all the communication between all the people involved in the project, uh, because uh, there were several people doing the project, and all of us were doing some different things, and in the end, we wanted to combine it all and have it run together smoothly. However, once something was changing, uh, once something changed in one part of the code, it could have easily messed up something in the other part of the code. Uh, so that was probably the most challenging part of this for me. Uh, nonetheless, this was a very interesting project and it was a very interesting experience. So I hope everyone enjoyed it as much as I did. Thank you for your attention. The whole project was a wonderful experience. We learned a lot about mobile scanning and even more about working as a team. In the end, we have the solution which can be used by major applications which require 3D data of urban environment. With little more work, this can be improved to a large degree. We really enjoyed the journey and I really hope you enjoyed it as well. Thank you.